Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. This week, we're talking with the one and only Mel Hankla. I think Mel is one of the most well-versed folks in long rifle culture that I've ever had the pleasure to talk with. Uh, we've been coordinating the time to sit down and talk here over the past couple of weeks, and Mel is co busy constantly. He's always out doing something cool, so I'm really happy to have him on the show. Mel, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor uh, for you to ask me to be part of this. Uh, I really admire what you're doing and respect what you're doing for the long rifle culture. Um, and I think it's very, very important. Uh, you know, I'm an educator by trade and what you're doing is educating the public and educating people about uh, today's long rifle culture. And, and I admire you for it. Well, thank you very much, Mel. That that means a lot, and I I'm uh, got some goosebumps hearing that from, from somebody like you. If I'm being honest, <laughs> so what's the? Could you tell us a little bit? I mean, I've been following you now for years online, and uh, I know a lot about your work. But for somebody listening now that doesn't know, you know, about you or about your work, what's the story about Mel Hanklow? How did you get started in in muzzleloading and history and the artistry of it all? Good question. And you know, uh, in order for me to answer that, I've really got to dig way back. Um, but you know. I really, there's there's two or three people that I have to give a lot of credit. A fellow by the name of Archie Stahl in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, I had known Archie for quite some time. He had been a uh, kind of a supporter of the Western Kentucky University Gun Club when I had started my undergraduate work there. And uh, he introduced me to Terry Leeper. Mm -hmm. who is well known uh, with the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association as the brainchild, of, or rather the Western Kentucky University gunsmithing seminars are his brainchild. And uh, I was working on my master's degree when uh, I, I met Terry. I was part of the very first seminar that they had at WKU. It actually lasted a month. It was a long time, but what a wonderful experience. And, and for the next three or four years, I was kind of working behind the scenes with that and, and with Terry. Um, however, as I was taking classes, um, a gentleman by the name of Jay Anderson uh, was teaching a folklore class. And um, out of the blue, he started telling and talking about the National Endowment for the Arts. And he happened to be on the board. And I knew immediately at that time uh, that something to do with the long rifle uh, was right in the auspices of the, the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts. And, mm. and uh, Terry Leeper had introduced me to Herschel House. And uh, of course, everybody was, you know, looks up to Herschel. He was, he's been a living legend as long as I've known him. And um, to make a long story short, I ended up uh, with the guidance of Jay Anderson. Um, I wrote a grant to apprentice the, it, it was the National Endowment of the Arts Apprenticeship Program. So I wrote a grant in 1984 uh, that paid Herschel House $20 an hour uh, to take me on as an apprentice. Wow. And what that did is, you know, it's like he said that he had shown several people tricks of the trade, but he'd really never had the opportunity before to have the time uh, to really get into the depths of, of building a rifle. And ultimately, I kept a shop in Herschel's shop uh, for almost three years. Hmm. So that's definitely my beginnings. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I guess I should go on to say I, I'm probably known more for being a collector than anything. And for for a number of years, I collected Herschel's rifles. And, um, you know, it was uh, I just started looking for them. And I think over the course of time, I've owned 31 or 32. And I would always sell one in order to upgrade to find a, another one that was better, <laughs> a better representation. And um, about... 1989 or 90, I sold basically the whole collection. I sold a dozen of Herschel's rifles for then unheard of prices um, in about four days. And I took that money and purchased the Jacob Young rifle, which was the rifle that had influenced Herschel more than anything else. Hmm. 
And um, so that was my beginning into the antique Kentucky rifle world. Okay. And then from there, it just grew. It did. It did. I, I started at that point. Um, you know, I've remained uh, very interested in contemporary arms. However, it was at that time that I really started focusing and and uh, uh, Earl Lanning, another mentor, uh, had taken me and introduced me to Joe Kendig. And I started uh, going to the Kendigs and visiting that collection um, two or three times a year. Um and it just started growing. I know I, uh, I know part of, of what you and I have talked about is a book that I published mm -hmm. um, back in 2020 called Into the Bluegrass. But that book actually started 30 years ago. Really? And it was, it was going to be called The Evolution of the American Long Rifle. And that's my interest in the long rifle had gotten to the point that what I and, and instead of it's like with buying this Jacob Young rifle that was made about 1815, what it did is I started at the tail end of it, if you will, and started working my way back. Okay. And I'd had the opportunity to buy a real early rifle, about a 1760s rifle that was made in the Christian Springs region of Pennsylvania. Ooh. And it had just, my, I, I've really used it as a lifelong study, if you will, of uh, the, the collecting that I've done has not been haphazard. Uh, it's very been very much focused and uh, tying things together, if you will. So have you always been a history lover? Or I guess my, my question is, did uh, your interest in, in muzzleloaders and long rifles come first? Or was it an interest in history back when you were studying in school? <laughs> I really hated history when I was in high school. Uh, the teacher that I had was awful. Uh, it was not interesting at all. Um, however, I think I was in such a hurry to get out of high school. I didn't like it at all. Hmm. Um, I actually graduated in three and a half years. <laughs> you were in a hurry. Yeah. And Christmas, my senior year, I started going to, to school at Lindsey Wilson College in Columbia, Kentucky. And one of the first classes that I took was was U.S. history. Uh, and the lady that was teaching it, her name was Norma Dix Winston. And she, she she was bound to have been 80 years old then. But she brought history alive. Hmm. She made it interesting. And for the first time in my life, I really enjoyed it. Um, she taught history and told the stories and, and put it in story form, I guess. And it's carried with me. I, you know, a lot of people will tell you, well, Hank was a storyteller. And, um, and I am because I worked with the Kentucky Humanities Council for 27 years uh, doing living history programs about George Rogers Clark and, and Simon Kenton. And those stories, those, those programs was me taking on their character and telling their stories. And, uh, you know, I really never thought about it before, um, till now, really, hmm. um, the book is done in a story format. I've, I've written into the bluegrass in a, in a form to where the, it's full of 500 photographs of wonderful, wonderful, um, antique historic icons, but the book is about their stories. The book is about the makers or the owners. And ultimately, just in our conversation now, it's dawned upon me, uh, the roots of that go back to Miss Norva Dix Winston hmm. at Lindsay Wilson College, because that's the way she taught it. That's the way I fell in love with history. I think it's really crucial for us to, to think about sharing stories, uh, uh, you know, and I understand the, you know, certain dates and certain people when it comes to history class, but I think it becomes so much more engaging when you tell that story of how something happened or how something led up to a historic event, rather than just jumping right to the, really the climax of, you know, different historic periods and talking about it. You're talking about this, uh, this original 1815 uh, long rifle that you've got. Do you care to talk about what else is in kind of your personal collection and uh, some of your favorites? I mean, I can I can only imagine seeing the Joe Kindig collection when you did. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, what's your collection look like now? Well, the Kindig collection is quite overwhelming. Um, and, uh, you know, let me, let me talk about it just a minute. Yeah. They... they uh, you know, I had tooled around for a number of years 
uh, looking at different guns and the majority of things that I had been, I'd had the opportunity to buy and even study was from Pennsylvania. Uh, but in my research, I kept, I kept reading about Michael Umble, uh, and it's actually pronounced with the H being silent, Michael or Umble, not it's spelled H U M B L E and the H is silent. So you, you, when you read it, you're going to say humble, uh, but the family is it always pronounces it without the H. Um, so I was constantly on the search as was a lot of other Kentucky collectors for this Michael Humble rifle. And out of the blue, about 1990, there's a rifle surfaced uh, that was signed C. Humble. And immediately I recognized the name. And I also realized that Michael Humble had a brother named Conrad because I'd studied the family uh, genealogy. However, I didn't have any idea. Nobody at that time had any idea that Conrad Humble was a gunsmith. And in just just quickly, I mean, within a week now having this rifle, um, the knowledge of this thing existing, um, we found Conrad Humble's uh, will in Bourbon County, Kentucky. And it said, I, Conrad Humble, gunsmith of Bourbon County, Kentucky region, Virginia. And this was in 1790. This was two years before Kentucky became the state of Kentucky, mm. before we reached statehood. And um, I, I reached and, and bought the rifle, was able to buy it. And in a lot of ways, that was the stepping stone that's taking me to where I'm at today. Uh, most all of the Pennsylvania stuff uh, has been sold to buy Kentucky things, mm -hmm. and they're rare. I mean, it's uh, the things, rifles made in the state of Kentucky are extremely rare. And, uh, and one of the reasons that, you, you know, you can attribute something, if it's not signed, you can, you know, you can make an attribution, but to find something signed in the state of Kentucky, uh, there may very well be less than 25 or 30 rifles in existence that's got a signature that, so we can uh, definitely document who made this and, and where this was made. And from those 25 or 30, and I'm talking artistic guns. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about the mountain rifles or, or things, you know, the everyday using guns with no butt plates. And, you know, I'm think I'm, I'm, I kind of follow along with Joe Kendig on this. It's is that the American long rifle was the first American art form. Definitely. Uh, so I, I look at, at these rifles as a canvas, if you will, for different aspects of art. And of course, the architecture, uh, the wonderful flowing lines of these rifles are artistic as well. But once that rifle is stocked up, it leaves all of this wonderful space for carving and engraving and, and wonderfully designed patch boxes and, and, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and say this, you know, for some of the listeners, uh, I often, when I'm giving a talk, I compare these rifles to automobiles hmm. and most anybody, I, I have no idea how old you are, but I don't think you're over 50. No, sir. But most anyone over 50 years of age, if they're driving down the highway and they meet a 57 Chevrolet, <laughs> they recognize it. Mm -hmm. If they meet a 55 Ford, they recognize it, and other cars too. But the reason that you're able to recognize those vehicles, and I'm sure in your world there's different ones, uh, but you recognize them by the subtle differences in their architecture. And the rifles are the same way. You can take the design of the patch box, the architecture of the stock, the style of the engraving, the overall style of the rifle, and, and usually, if you're studied, whether it's signatured or not, if you're studied, you can oftentimes tell within 15 or 20 miles of where it was made and within five to 10 years of when it was made, just but those subtle changes in the architecture. It's so it, it's a, it is incredible. And it's a, it, it's a, it's a detailed study. And you really have to look at a lot of things. Um, but that, that, that's been my life, really. Hmm. So you talk about you only be able to, uh, you know, 
pinpoint a, such a small percent of these fine Kentucky rifles? Why are they so rare? Was there just not a lot of documentation or have we lost them to time somewhere? You know, it, it's, I think they're lost to time. Mm. Uh, I think the vast majority of them were used up. And again, Kentucky was late in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were 1792. The two Umble rifles, the Conrad Umble and the Michael Umble, as far as I know, uh, and I've I've searched pretty hard, as far as I know, they are the only two rifles that we can document to have been made in Kentucky in the 18th century. And the reason that we can do that is they're both signed. And we know who made them, and we know when their makers lived and when their makers died. And then stylistically, we can also put them into the 18th century. Hmm. Um, but by 1800, Lexington, Kentucky was called the Athens of the West. And there was a lot of money. You had a lot of, of agriculture going on, a lot of people coming in and 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 basically importing, growing tobacco and, and sending things back to Virginia. So you had wealthy people coming in. They, they could afford a big brick home. I know one of my greatest, uh, uh, you know, reading things, I, I was reading a, a uh, uh, some research one time and and uh, oh I'm trying to remember now what book it was in and I and I cannot and but anyway someone had asked this gentleman why he came to Kentucky and he said I came to get I came to see a fine brick house rise out of the cane breaks. Hmm. And, and, you know, when we talk about the American dream, and at that point in time, it was the Kentucky dream. Um, Ellen Eslinger wrote a book called Running Mad for Kentucky. And at that point in time, Kentucky was anything across the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah. So. You know, it was the western expansion of America. You'd had people that had come in, kind of got their 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 bearings and and their feet pulled back under them after coming across the ocean and being on the eastern seaboard for a while, and now they're climbing over the mountain and heading west into this great expanse. And uh, but like I started to say, you know, Lexington was the Athens of the West and the finest of furniture makers. These big brick homes coming out of the out of the ground and the culture culture was of such that uh, finery was being produced, whether it was artwork by Asa Blanchard or silver, or excuse me, silver by Asa Blanchard or artwork by Matthew Harris Jewett. But at the same time, you had the Bryan family that had come into Kentucky from North Carolina. And, uh, you know, Daniel Boone's wife, Rebecca, was a Bryan. Hmm. Uh, and the Bryans also were associated with the Young family of Jacob Young. And then really kind of the next rifle as my research, my, the next the, after the Jacob Young come into my life, kind of the next rifle uh, to draw my attention was made by Thomas Simpson for Casper Mansker. Hmm. And I never dreamed, I studied this rifle for 20 or 25 years, never dreaming that I would ever have the opportunity to purchase it from the family. It still was in the family. Dr. Uh, William Simpson of, of that lived in Dallas, Texas. This guy was a, a he was a um, a neurosurgeon, and had actually been um, he he worked on John F. Kennedy when he was shot. Wow. In 1964, he um, so I don't know. It's just all kind of fell together, and it's it's like the Simpson from the young to the Simpson. Then that research started bringing me into Kentucky, and I found the Conrad Umble rifle um, the very first time that I went to Kendig's. Earl Lanning took me there. I'd been wanting to go for years, and he just kept telling me I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're just not ready. And, and that's the one misconception that people get with the Kendig collection. It's a business. Mm -hmm. These guns are for sale, and it's not really there to go study. Uh, it's the kind of thing that if you if you are studied in the American long rifle and you make contact and say, hey, I'm doing a research study on York County or, or uh, you know, any number of gun makers, they'll let you in. And they'll let you come and look at the collection and what they've got. But you have to be far enough along 
in your knowledge that you know what you're looking for because to walk into this place with 600 plus rifles uh, it's just breathtaking you, yeah. you know so you so the only finally when i had bought the conrad humble earl realized that i was ready because now i had something to look for i wanted to find something that associated with this conrad humble and ultimately, I found a Michael Umble in the Kendig collection that had been there all those years, and uh, the signature had not been recognized. Huh. Wow. That's incredible. It is. I mean, it is incredible. And you were talking about goosebumps. It still gives me goosebumps to, <laughs> to, to, to you know, to uh, think about it today. For good reason. Wow. I can I uh, when I had the chance to go out to Rock Island this summer and handle some of those, you know, not nearly as... I guess I would say iconic, but, um, you know, several of those attributed guns were just, it was just fascinating to hold some of that history that, uh, had been preserved for a few hundred years. Like it had been, it's just, it's just cool. Do you ever get over that feeling or does it still get you going every time? It still gets me going. It's, you know, it really does. Uh, still to this day, you know, there's a, <laughs> a lot of things called sleep calls, sleepless nights. Uh, but I can still to this day, I can, I can pick up a powder horn and, and put the optivisors on and, and, uh, set under a light and, or, or pick up a fine rifle and, and they never grow old. They, they never, <laughs> uh, the, the feeling of solace that they provide, uh, has never stopped. So you've done the, you've done the research and you've done the building and uh, you're, you've done the collecting. And now we're seeing you, uh, more. I think most recently, at the fair at New Boston, portraying the, icon, the Kentucky icon of Simon Kenton. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got into, you know, from what we've been talking about to the historic interpretation and the living history? Well, I have to go back uh, to my mentor. I lost my father when I was 20. And at 22, I met a gentleman named Earl Lanning. Um, you're probably familiar with the Foxfire books. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And Foxfire 5 is uh, dedicated, a large part of it, uh, to the long rifle. And literally, it was Earl Lanning that made friends with Elliot Wigington and was instrumental in the entire, uh, all of those chapters that's in the Foxfire book. Whether, you know, he insisted that he come spend time with Herschel House uh, for that wonderful chapter, the same way with Jim Chambers and Bob Watts and, and uh, Joe Farmer and all of those those gunsmiths, they were all introduced to Elliot Wigington, who was over the Foxfire Fund, uh, by Earl. And uh, I met Earl, you know, when I was 22, and and he kind of took me under his wing. And I know at that that point in time, I was still hot on Herschel's things, and <laughs> and uh, and he was at my house one night late in late in the evening, and I'm sure. Um, uh, there had been large quantities of alcohol consumed, but uh, Early made the comment to me. He said, you need to sell all of these damn things and buy one good uh, antique rifle. And I said, <laughs> what are you talking about? I said, this is, the, this is the greatest collection of Herschel House rifles that's ever been assembled. And he said, so what? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it sunk in, you know, yeah. and, and uh, it was soon after that that I sold the rifles and bought the Jacob Young. But um, what that did is put me in a position. I, I was I was teaching school in Albany, Kentucky, and I hated it. I, I just I literally hated it. And um, anyway, I, I come home one Thursday evening and the local paper was there and there was a call for characters with the Kentucky Humanities Council. And the deadline was the next day. Hmm. Uh, but when I read this, I, I knew that I could do Simon Kenton. And the reason that I knew I could do Simon Kenton is because my mentor, Earl Lanning, had spent six or seven years researching Kenton uh, and to culminate in a bronze. Uh, it's called A Sound in the Wilderness. I forget the year that he produced this. Uh, but at that point in time, there were only two paintings or likenesses of Kenton known. And he was a very old man. And he had taken those to a police forensic expert in Atlanta and had Kenton's face uh, rebuilt as a 20-year-old oh, okay. man. Wow. And he took that and did a bronze of Simon Kenton. 
so immediately when when I saw this, I said, hey, you know, I can do this. It give me kind of a an out, if you will, from the school systems. And um, I called the next day and they said, hey, if you can want to hand deliver it here and have it here by eight o'clock Monday morning, we'll accept your your, uh, you know, application. And, and I was, you know, I, I was presented with a part and, mm. and I still present. Simon Kenton today, you know, yeah. 20, 28, 29 years later. And, and, and the study of Simon Kenton has been a big part of, of my life as well. And um, matter of fact, I'm sitting here in my office right now. There was six years ago, there was a, a, a wonderful painting of Kenton at about 60 years old that surfaced uh, by Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, it had descended in the family and kind of got separated and, I was able to purchase it as well. So he's just been a, a big part of my life, as as has been George Rogers Clark. You know, as I was go, uh, traveling around the country for a while, I was doing as many as 70 shows a year. Um, uh, you know, first-person interpretations of Simon Kenton. Hmm. Wow. And uh, But but when the core, when, when the... I guess it would have been the 200th anniversary of the Corps of Discovery, the, uh, you know, the Lewis and Clark expedition. Yeah. It dawned on me that everybody confused. When you said George Rogers Clark, everybody thought you were talking about Lewis and Clark. Yeah. And they had no idea that William Clark was George Rogers Clark, 18 year younger brother. Yeah. They had no idea that George Rogers Clark uh, was instrumental in the founding of Louisville, Kentucky. They had no idea that George Rogers Clark with 170 men enlarged the United States by double. Mm -hmm. And then his little brother, William, along with Meriwether Lewis, enlarged the nation by more than double again by exploration 20 some years later. Yeah. So, uh, you know, George Rogers Clark, that part for me, where Kenton was a love, and I guess uh, it was kind of a pet peeve of me that I felt like that Kenton done every bit, if not more, than Daniel Boone. So <laughs> that was the reason that I really fell in love with Kenton. Yeah. But I just really hated to see George Rogers Clark left behind and be misunderstood. So, What's it like uh, doing the research and, and portraying them? Uh, you know, th through all these years that you've been doing it, has that has has their interpretation? Have you has your interpretation of them changed over the years, or has it stayed? Uh, you know, kind of an even even cadence. No, it's changed immensely. Hmm. Uh, it, it's really remarkable because you start out with a script. You know, you start out, you set, you write this script, and you memorize this thing uh, in order to be able to tell this story. And, and in the beginning, there's all these different parts that seem to be really, really important. And then after four or five years, the script goes away. And it no longer matters if you drop a line hmm. uh, because you're telling his story. And it doesn't make any difference at what point in time in your talk that you tell that part of his story and then as you research more you learn more so there's more added and then then it comes to the point that you start reading audiences and if you go in and you're talking to a sixth grade class they get one story <laughs> but if you're in a museum setting and are talking to a board of directors of a of a major museum they get a completely another part of, of that story. So yeah, it's, it's changed immensely. Um, but you ask how it was or what it was like. Um, there's probably been nothing in my life that was as much of an escape because I know there's a lot of times and it's, it's funny, you know, you go to do a program and you know, you've got this costume on and you're behind the curtain and somebody does an introduction time after time after time. I had not an idea what, how to start the show. But <laughs> some way between the time I stepped outside the curtain and headed towards my chair, all of a sudden you take that character and it all comes flooding in. And there's many, many times that when I finished, it seemed like minutes, four or five minutes. I know um, I was... <sighs> I think I was in Asheville, Kentucky at the Paramount Theater, and I had a huge crowd one night, a wonderful, wonderful audience. 
and everybody was comfortable, good air conditioning, you know, and, and it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. It was before supper. So you didn't have to deal with people falling asleep because they'd eat too much. <laughs> and, uh, I know I got in the car after we left and my wife looked at me and she said, have you got any idea how long you went tonight? I said, I don't have a clue. She said, an hour and 37 minutes. <laughs> and she said, I looked around and you didn't lose a person. And and it, it seems like no time at all. So mm-hmm. that's the only way that I can answer that question. That's what it's like Yeah. To, to, to tell that story and to get into that person's head and to become that person. It's a very... Uh, rewarding. It's a it's a it's a powerful thing, but it takes an enormous amount of energy. Uh, but it's it's a you go away. It's an escape. Hmm. That sounds incredible. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. I, I feel like I've been, you know, jumping across kind of these these periods and these different activities that you've been involved in over the years. But you've done so much, and I, I want to try to, ca- you know, share as much in little sections of it <laughs> as as we can, and, and maybe we can come back in a, in another episode and, and dive in deep. But you've done just about everything there is when it comes to muzzleloading and, and living history. What brought you now to organizing the uh, the long rifle art shows like you are uh, coming up? this weekend by the time folks hear this with the fall frolic in Lawrenceburg. Can you tell us a little bit what it's like to organize that event and, and why you started doing it? I will. I, and, and again, this started many, many years ago. Uh, it actually, ultimately it started at my house in Jamestown, Kentucky, down on Lake Cumberland as a hammer in, hmm. uh, you know, I had, you know, probably a dozen people were coming in. Uh, we had four or five blacksmith forges set up. Uh, they were going to come in on a like on a Wednesday night or Thursday, and we were going to, you know, spend two or three days at the forge and make knives and and things. And uh, there was an ice storm, and I called and told everybody I was out of power, and that hey, you know, we, we needed to call it off. And they all came anyway. I'd <laughs> lost thirty some trees. They brought chainsaws. We were out of electricity for this whole period of time. But it turned into a show and tell. We took, you know, four by eight sheets of plywood and put them up on on saw horses. And there was, you know, probably as many as 15 or 20 Herschel House rifles and Frank House rifles and Willie White knives. And, you know, I mean, it was just a big show and tell. And and, uh, it was the beginning of an annual, we call this the hammer in for a number of years. And... uh, I think at the house, we added at the house for three years, and then we moved uh, to Lake Cumberland State Park, and it became the, you know, the Lake Cumberland show. Mm -hmm. And last year was the 27th year. So, uh, but really what you're talking about is is what we have dubbed the fall frolic. Uh, And that happened last year out of necessity. Um, The, because of COVID, the CLA had exchanged dates with Tim Hodges, who has had a show for more than 30 years in Virginia, up in the Valley of Virginia. And his dates were always, have been for years, Halloween weekend. And of course, the CLA's dates is the third weekend of August. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not because of COVID, uh, but because of construction. They were redoing Heritage Hall. So we swapped dates with Tim. And he had his show in August, and then the CLA was going to be Halloween weekend. And four weeks, exactly four weeks to the day before the CLA was to take place, um, the people at Heritage Hall called and canceled out. They'd run into a plumbing problem, was not going to have the facility ready. Uh, 
And I know Lally House called me and she said, Lord, what am I going to do? You know, her, you know, the CLA for so many of the artists mm-hmm. is where they come and bring a year's worth of work to sell or take orders for another year. And I had just published into the bluegrass. Uh, I, I needed to sell books. Yeah. Um, and I told Wally, I said, hey, let's have a show. Let's find a place. Uh, let's have a show. And and so Frank got on the phone and started calling around. And he's actually the one that come up with the, the facility in, in um, uh, uh, Sharonville, Ohio. But it, it wasn't me. It's not just me. This this show, The Fall Frolic, is very much a partnership between Frank and Lally House and my wife, Angela, and I. And it takes all four of us to do it. We've all got a job. We all know what we're doing. Uh, the show was born out of necessity last year. We had a, a hundred and, I believe, 58 tables and uh, 842 people through the door and it was in the middle of COVID but we were careful, we wore masks uh, you know and we didn't intend to do it again but everybody wanted us to do it again so but the the venue at Sharingville was horrible they were horrible to us, they were horrible to work with and it was a, in a situation there was hard you know food was a problem and uh, it was hard to get to on the north side of Cincinnati if you were coming from the south. Mm-hmm. So um, the the reason we'd found Sharonville to begin with was the people at Lawrenceburg. Uh, Frank had called them first, and and uh, the girl there had said, "Hey, we'd love to have you, but we're shut down. But Lawrence or Sharonville will take you." So we went back to Lawrenceburg, and it is wonderful. It's on the river. They've got a forty by four hundred foot patio that's along the river. That's right outside the restaurant and the bar and a Starbucks coffee. And the rooms are wonderful, and they give us this wonderful rate of eighty nine ninety five. And then the gun room is on ground floor and easy in. And mm-hmm. the little town of of uh, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, it's kind of like Charleston. Uh, South Carolina, you know, there's just little pubs and restaurants and little shops. And, uh, of course, there's a gambling casino six or seven blocks from where we're at, and it's kept the little town very viable. So um, I don't know. It's kind of, again, it's labor of love. It's, yeah. and, and what we've continued to talk about with this show is we want it to be a promotionary kind of show. It's like I told you at the beginning, you know, if you want to come and bring – information about your podcast and what you're doing you bring it we'll see to it that you get a table uh the nmlra is coming the nra is coming uh the kentucky long rifle association is coming and what we're wanting uh, you know i'm I, we've been asked a lot well are you don't you think this is in competition with the cla and it's exactly the opposite because mm-hmm. the cla we've give them two tables to promote the cla and this is the kind of show that anybody can walk through the door, pay their $10. If they like what they're doing, they can go over and join the CLA and become a member. And so we want it to become known as a, as an event that gives back. And Frank come up with a wonderful idea last year. We bought a knife from Joe Seabolt and we paid Joe face value, exactly mm-hmm. what he wanted for that knife. However, Joe had to sell the tickets on it. And we <laughs> sold tickets for $5 a piece, which brought people to Joe's table. Yeah. And he got to talk to them about the knife. And then on, I believe it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, on Friday, when it was kind of the ultimate crowd, we gave that knife away. But not only did we give the knife away, we gave all of the money. We paid Joe. And they was a little over $600 left. So we took that money and divided it into three pots. I believe it was 200, 100, and maybe it was 50. I don't, I don't remember, but you get the gist of it. Mm-hmm. So uh, we give the money back, but we give it in show books so that that money that had been spent on that knife went back to the artist. It went, it was only to be spent at the show. And this year we're going to do two knives. Steve Alvenshein has done that. We're going to give his knife away on Friday. Glenn McLean has done a knife that we're going to do the same thing uh, on Saturday. So we'll be giving the knife away as well as giving that cash 
back hmm. as show bucks to be spent at the show. That's fantastic. I think, you know, especially last year, it was it was really hard for a lot of artists and, and small businesses here because a lot of the shows were just shut down and they, they were just really stuck. And that was a, a big concern for me coming into this year is, is how many people, you know, might not be at the, you know, the event circuit this year because they, they couldn't make it through last year. And I think I, I, I'm one of the people that's really happy to see you continue with this show. I couldn't make it out last year and uh, i'm really excited to come down uh this year and i i think to the the point of, of competition i think that it's something i try to uh, you know an idea i present about it to people is i don't think that when it comes to to muzzleloading and, and long rifle culture there's uh, i don't think we're at the threshold yet where there's you know enough going on that you're starting to compete uh, between the you know shows and organizations and events and things uh, I, agree. I think there's more than enough room right now for for more people to get involved and for more events to go on to to keep all this growing and moving absolutely i agree with you wholeheartedly I'll put a, a link in the show notes, but where can people go to, to learn more about this show coming up if, if they want to come and, and spend a couple of days shopping and hanging out with some contemporary artisans? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, the Probably the best thing would, would go to Facebook. You know, go to Facebook and type in Fall Frolic. Mm. Uh, we've got a, a Fall Frolic uh, Facebook site, but it's... It, I'll be honest, I'm not good at keeping that kind of thing up. Uh, but even if you'll go to either Frank House's page or, or my page, Mel Hankless page, you're going to find something about the fall frolic. We're, we're going to be, you know, posting things about it every day, you know, for the next week, because it's actually one week from today uh, we'll be setting up. This time next week, people, uh, the vendors will be there to, to set up. Hmm. And the show opens at nine o'clock in the morning on Friday. And uh, what about Saturday? Does it open up at nine? Same minutes? deal. Opens okay. at nine o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday and closes at four o'clock in the afternoon. OK, fantastic. I'll, I'll put some information uh, on the website to go with this episode, too, to make it uh, make it easy okay. for folks to find. OK, fantastic. So the, the last question is, I think, kind of a two parter. Um, I'll start with, you know. Being, I think, a contemporary icon of, of long rifle culture, what suggestions or, or resources would you direct uh, some of the younger folks that have gotten into it over the last couple of years? Uh, where would you direct them to go learn more about the kind of things that you're talking about and uh, that you're passionate about? There's several things that's going on that that's I think's just phenomenal. Uh, Ian Pratt and I think it's the Southern Ohio Artisans. Uh, I mm -hmm. might be corrected on that, uh, but they're giving away some some uh, um, scholarships for classes that they're doing, um, and and I think that's so important. You know, they're you know because a lot of people just don't have the money to spend. It's it's some of these classes are expensive. Uh, you know, I, I would suggest the Western Kentucky University Gunsmithing Seminar. It's expensive, uh, but I think the CLA is given a, a, a scholarship for that. I know Joe Seabolt is doing classes. Uh, I don't remember the, the location, but I know he and Frank House have been doing some knife making seminars uh, there that, uh, and I think again, I think there's, there's scholarships for that. Um, but there's a lot of people that's doing class, classes. Mike Davis out in our, our um, uh, I guess Missouri he is now. Um, it's you know there's just a lot of classes and if you're really interested you know i'd study the original rifles I, I i remember you know a few years ago 15 or 20 years ago i think you know the contemporary guns um some of them lost sight of what they really were. It was kind of like, I don't know when you was a, a kid or not, you may have not have done this, but when I was in, you know, kindergarten or first grade, they'd put you in a circle and they'd have somebody whisper something into uh -huh. somebody's ear. Yep. And that guy would whisper it again and it'd go all the way around the circle. And it wasn't anything like it started out to be. And that's kind of what the contemporary gun was doing for a while, is people were building contemporary rifles by looking at contemporary rifles by somebody that had looked at a contemporary rifle, mm -hmm. and they'd really lost sight 
of what that original concept was. So um, I would really encourage anybody that's that's really wanting to, to build any of the art forms from the contemporary world, whether it's powder horns or knives or tomahawks or, or long rifles, to look at the originals. Buy Joe Kendig's book. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, buy Peterman's uh, tomahawk book. Uh, there's several powder horn books, but, um, you know, buy Jimmy Dresser's powder horn books. And if you're interested in Kentucky stuff, buy my book. You know, it, um, it's it's at endofthebluegrass.net, and, and it's full. It's divided all of the Kentucky schools, the Bardstown School, the Lexington School, the, the Barons uh, have all been divided. And there's wonderful photographs of, of these original rifles to really give you a foundation, a base, um, to have a better understanding of really what you're working on and what you want to do. Yeah. I think it's important as fun as, as it is to, to get your, to get your gun and and your bag and your horn and and go out and shoot. I think it enhances the fun to go back and see where it all came from and and to understand that timeline. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. And talking about timeline, where do you think the, community goes in like the next 10 or 15 years what do you think it looks like in in 2030 you know is the community going to evolve you know long rifle culture going to change and evolve more or do you think it's going to you know is it going to be a fast change or a slow change another great question um one of my greatest reg- regrets is that when we formed the contemporary long rifle association 26 years ago now I so wish that I'd had the foresight to have developed some kind of a measuring instrument, some kind of a tool to record and have a baseline measure of the art and the quality of the contemporary art of that day of 26 years ago, the quality of powder horns, the the historical authenticity as well as the ability to build these things, to make these things. And then I wish I could have done it five years later Mm -hmm. and 10 years later, because what happens with these shows and especially like with the CLA is people would do their best. They would bring it to the show and have it on the table and all of the other makers would go, Oh man, that's cool. And then they go home and they sharpen up their tools. Yep. And for next year, I'm going to beat that. I'm, I'm going to make something better than that. And so that's been happening for 26 or seven years now of this venue where people have brought their best only to be outshined by somebody else that had done better. And the people that's really got it and really gets it and really wants to do this, they go back home and do better the next time. And all of these classes have have ensued. You know, you've mm-hmm. got the house boys doing all of their seminars and WKU and all of these, you know, these different educational seminars. So we're at a place right now with this long rifle culture with a knowledge that's never been had before. I mean, not even in the 18th and 19th century when the original guns were going on. There's there's more rifles and rifle makers now than there's ever been in history. But now I would like to think that this is going to continue. I would like to think that we're going to continue to grow. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we're fighting an uphill battle in some ways. You know, the political atmosphere um, in America today is anti-gun oriented. Um, and, um, there's a lot of things that could happen that, that could make this change. And I really, I really hope and pray that, that we can continue and that we can continue to learn. And, um, there's a lot of us, I'm, I don't care to tell you, I'm 65 years old and there's a lot of us in the last 10 or 15 years has really wondered if there would be somebody because we've been the youngsters all these years hmm. and we wondered if there was going to be somebody else that would come along 
and there has been, you know, there's all of these, like with what you're doing, uh, the, the CLA has got a Facebook forum. There's a group in Tennessee over iron mounted rifles. You, you know, you've got very, very interested groups, the American long rifle forum, you know, there's more activity and more knowledge and more teaching and more hunger for knowledge right now than there's, than I've ever seen in my life. So I think it's safe. But but I have no idea, you know, mm-hmm. how it's going to progress in the next 15 years. I just I hope and pray that we can continue and uh, that we are allowed the freedom to continue um, because this is what made America. If it hadn't been for the American long rifle, you know, in, in my book, what I wanted to do is to stretch a tapestry, if you will, of America's cultural fabric. And every weaving, every cloth has to have a weft. It has to have a common cord that holds it all together. And I contend that this American long rifle, this Kentucky rifle, that's the weft of America's cultural fabric. Because if it hadn't been for the rifle, uh, people couldn't have been fed. They couldn't have protected themselves. Um, The culture that's developed that we are enjoying today would have never developed if it hadn't been for the Kentucky rifle. Is there anything else that you'd like me to, uh, to direct people to or, or link them to? Um, you know, the only thing I, I, I would say, if you're interested, you know, in a book, there's good pictures and information at end of the bluegrass.net. Uh, I have no problem. If anyone has questions about anything I've talked about today or even comments, my email is Mel Hankla at amhiss.com, A-M-H-I-S-S dot com. Uh, I'm going to be terribly busy getting ready for the show, and we're leaving here next Wednesday to go get things set up. But I will be, I will go out of my way to try to answer any emails that I would receive with questions or comments regarding the show, you know, regarding anything that uh, um, I'm sure I've said some things that might ruffle some feathers, but if I have, you know, email me about it. They will talk about it. I'd like to thank Mel once again for coming onto the show. And, uh, and like I said there, we'll have links to everything that Mel has talked about and uh, information on how to contact Mel in the show notes for this episode, along with the blog that will go up to uh, ilovemuzzleloading.com, where you can uh, easily access all the stuff that Mel is talking about and get in touch with him and, uh, and start one of these conversations. I think it's really great that somebody like Mel has been um, really influential in the community and, and really active in it in preserving a lot of this history. Uh, I think it's great that he's so willing to talk to people and, and, and continue these conversations. So if you have something that you want to talk to Mel about, please reach out to him. He couldn't be a nicer guy. And uh, I'm sure that you'll have a great conversation with him. I think this marks our 15th episode of the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. I'd like to thank you all so much for listening. I'd like to thank you for the reviews and the nice comments that we've been receiving on it. If you want to hear more, be sure to subscribe where you get your podcasts. I think we're on all the major platforms now. Subscribing doesn't cost anything. Uh, It just lets you know when new episodes are published so you can listen to them as soon as you're ready for them. If you'd like to help out the show, uh, the best thing and the the thing that I ask that you do is uh, leave us a rating and uh, and tell a friend that might be interested in muzzleloading, living history, long rifle culture, any aspect that we talk about here on the show, send them a link uh, to an episode that you think they would enjoy. We try to really vary up the topics that we're talking about here on the show to cover all things muzzleloading so we can preserve as many aspects of this as we can and uh, and the stories of the people that have gotten us to where we are today. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. If you could uh, tell a friend and, uh, and leave us a rating that helps us reach more people out there that might not know Uh, about some of the great people that we've been interviewing here on the show. I will be at the Fall Frolic on Saturday. I'm excited to head down uh, bright and early and attend the show and catch up with some folks from the CLA show and some that I haven't been able to see really all summer. I've got my uh, I've got my shopping list ready here, I think, before, uh, you know, kind of leading into the fall season here. This is one of the last shows of the season in the area here. So I'm excited to to go out and uh, and get some more pieces of kit and gear to add to my my meager collection here 
if you can't make it out to the show, uh, we'll have a full video and uh, a lot of photos and uh, a bit of a write-up about the show at ilovemuslining.com. Probably the week after the show, mid to late week after the show, we'll have all that stuff out. So you can catch the show and see what it was like. Uh, one of my favorite things to do at these shows is to collect a bunch of business cards from the artisans and craftspeople and small businesses uh, and and try to bring those to your attention. I know here we recommend a lot of the big players in the muzzleloading space, but uh, really if you're looking for something, especially with uh, the holiday shopping season coming up, with a lot of supply chain issues out there, you can uh, shop from some of the long rifle and muzzleloading craftspeople and businesses out there and not have to worry about if something's going to arrive in time or not. So um, as much as I, I would like you to watch the video that we'll put out for the show and, and take a look at the photos, what I'd really like you to do is, is check out the business cards and the contact information of the artisans and the small businesses here and, uh, and shop with them if you can um, for some of your gear and your equipment when it comes to uh, your muzzleloading setup. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. If you want to learn more about this or anything else related to muzzleloading, please visit ilovemuzzleloading.com. This is a passion project for me here. And, uh, you know, it's something that I, I really enjoy being able to have these conversations. I, I'd like to thank my wife Paisley for being so patient with me, uh, spending the time that I do on this project. She couldn't be any more supportive than she is. And I'd just like to, to thank her. And so if you ever see her at a show, tag along with me, uh, you know, give her a thanks too, because uh, she makes all of this possible for me. And I, I can't thank her enough. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time.